Happy, happy Resurrection Day. I hope your, I hope the joy of the Lord is your strength, and that you're excited to be alive in Jesus. If you aren't, work on that. Amen. <laughs> this is your first time with us, you say, well, this hasn't gone anything like I expected Easter to go. I know. We're pretty much bored with how churches do things, so we do our own thing. Because one of the things Jesus died to bring us all was freedom, liberty, not to make us religious. So we're excited about Jesus here, and we show that however loudly and randomly and passionately we can. And uh, there are professional bands that sing about Jesus, and then there's bar bands like ours that sing to Jesus, and I'll take that, amen? Um, so we're excited about Jesus being alive, and so we have a, a good time when we gather. A couple of things that are coming up in the community, I want to be responsible and get to this before we do some other things here, um, just as by way so you know. So on Saturday, April the 10th, so I believe that's the coming Saturday, coming up. Um, Highland Park Church is hosting a gathering to uh, pray, discuss, and brainstorm around the human trafficking problem that's uh, affecting the whole country right now. Um, if you believe that our problems are relegated to three states in the South, then you're really not paying attention um, and so this is going to be, I think, a, a wonderful event just to gather and brainstorm with some people. Um, they've got guest speakers from Vision Beyond Borders and uh, Rescue America, several leaders from different movements that are trying to help with this human trafficking problem. Um, so that'll be from 9 to 3, and they provide lunch. That'll be on Saturday. But their registration is limited to 70 people, I imagine, because of COVID and whatever. So if you want to go to that, I just give them a call and register, and uh, I think it'll be really good information. There's also a sign-up sheet on the, on, the, on the table out there for the Come and See Bible Study of the Book of John. Uh, today's your last chance to sign up because um, we have to get the books ordered. So if you want to do it, sign up. If you want to invite a friend to do it with you, study guides cost $10, and they'll be distributed next Sunday so you can begin working on the study. The study is going to happen on Thursday nights at 7 p.m. If you want to come in person, Carrie will be teaching in the fellowship hall at 7, but it's also going to be on Zoom at that time. If you can't get to the church, you'll be able to Zoom in like you guys were on the last Bible study. So that'll be, uh, that's going to be a good time. We love the Word, my wife and I. Um, there's different trends that go on in the church and different things that happen, but we're just old-fashioned redneck people that like the Bible. And so we find the answers in the Bible. We're not ashamed of what the Bible says, not particularly concerned if the culture is excited about it because um, they didn't write it and neither did I. And so we just like to study the Scriptures. If you are a person who's strong in the Scriptures, you'll have strength for the days to come. And if you're a person who's anemic in the Scripture, you will struggle. And it, for it to be that black and white and simple, I know it's difficult for people, but it's just true. Get in your Bible and invite the Holy Spirit to teach you the Scripture, and you will do far better than if you don't make time for that. So study the Scriptures. Join in the Bible studies that happen at the church when you can, if you can't, on your own. The cool thing about the Bible is that the Spirit that wrote it is with you when you read it. So if you've ever read a book by somebody famous and you go like, man, it would be fun to sit down with Tom Clancy and ask him about the hunt for Red October, well, anytime you open your Bible, the author is there. So that's why you can get as much out of it as you want if you can embrace that. So you doing all right so far? So in a moment, we're going to take communion together. But I want us to take a minute and just really think. Um, you know, as, as we get excited about what we're celebrating today, Jesus is alive. In fact, everybody just say that with me. Jesus is alive. That's the cornerstone of what makes the church the church. We're going to get more into this in our, in our actual teaching in a minute. But where the culture would try to pound us and say Christianity is no different than any other faith, that is a complete lie. Because the leader of every other great faith is dead. 
and stayed dead. And only the Christian church is following the man who conquered death and hell. And so there is no actual common ground. Now, I know that in our day and hour, like, oh, no, we've got to find the common ground. And there isn't any. If the teacher you're following is dead, mine's alive. So, no, I am not going to bother to condescend to what your guy said because he died. I'm going to follow the guy who's alive. And so, so the Christian faith is completely distinct from all of the other faiths across the whole planet. And they don't like that, and I don't care. I, I'm, I mean, I'm sorry. We are living in a crazy time. If you're offended by Jesus, cope. I'm not Jesus. I didn't write the book. I didn't write the gospel. I didn't record it. I don't get to fix it. I don't get to change it. So if you jump up and go, I'm offended, take it up with God. I didn't write it. What I know is Jesus Christ conquered the power of sin and death, and he did it by dying upon the cross, which no other great world faith leader ever was willing to do anything that even resembles a sacrifice for the sins of those who would follow them. The cross and the empty tomb are the entire story. Study everything you want. I hope you love to study. I hope you learn all about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I hope you learn all about David. I hope you learn all about the feasts and you understand all the symbology. And if you never learn about any of that, if you know about the cross and you know about an empty tomb, you know enough because that's the cornerstone of the Christian gospel. When the church was invited by Jesus to take communion regularly and Jesus told us why, do this often and remember me. Everybody just say remember me because he knew that in the coming generations and centuries of the church, people would muddy the water and blur the imagery and try to make this complicated. And he speaks all the way to the end of time to the churches that are in the last days like we are. And he says, look, take this meal together often and remember me. See through the fog of all of that stuff and remember that I am the way. And remember that I am the truth. And remember that I am the life and unless a man come to the father by me he can't come at all just remember me and you can make it at any point we struggle we lost him and as soon as I find him again I'm stable because he's the king of kings and he's the lord of lords so we're going to get to some scripture and, 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 and maybe hoot and holler a little bit about the fact that he's alive but First, we're going to take communion together, and I want us to remember why the miracle of the resurrection required the death of Jesus. If he doesn't die, there's nothing to overcome. And so we're going to take communion together. Yes, Lord. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, the scripture says he took some bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he said, take this and eat it. It is my body that is broken for you. So, Lord, as we take this simple element this morning, we thank you for what it represents. You allowed yourself to be broken that we could be made whole. And we praise you and we thank you for that. And it's in your name we receive this today. You can take the bread. You then took a cup, and you blessed that too. And you said, this is going to be a new covenant in my blood. And we are so grateful for the blood that was shed, Jesus. Your sacrifice, it goes beyond our imagination. People have tried to make movies about it. People have tried to help us understand it. And yet I still think we are probably falling so short in understanding what happened that day. But we take this meal together the way you invited us to, to remember that you paid the ultimate price so that we could be forgiven. And we thank you for that. And it's in your name and with great gratitude that we receive this cup today. 
you can take the cup. We love you, Jesus. We praise you. We thank you for your great sacrifice and your great love. And we ask you to bless our time together. Since you're standing already, and if you sat down, ha ha, stand up again. Um, we're going to read our two verses real quick before we move on. So from the Word of God in Mark chapter 16 and verse 19, it says, So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven, and he sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. And then Mark knew he'd done good, so he said, Amen. Father, bless your word as well. Pray that it would be the word that nourishes our souls today. Lead us into the truth in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. amen. You can be seated now for real. No more pump fakes. Amen. You'll be able to sit for a minute. Just going to take a, I don't want to take a real long time today. So Mark is... Um, an amazing gospel because he manages to say in 16 chapters what it takes Matthew 28 and Luke 28 or 29, I can't remember, and uh, John quite a while and Mark just gets to the point, amen, cuts to the chase as we would say. And so this is his summation of the ministry, the earthly ministry of Jesus after the resurrection and he says, so then after the Lord had spoken to them, and we know that he's referencing the fact that the scripture tells us that after the resurrection, Jesus spent 40 days teaching them about the kingdom of God. And Mark is saying when he was done with all that he was teaching, it says he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And there is a great amount of truth hiding in that simple statement. For when he says that he was received up into heaven, it does not mean that Jesus returned to heaven and he was allowed in. It does not mean that he returned to heaven and they said, oh good, you're back. This is your spot. What Mark is referencing is that Jesus receives the hero's welcome in heaven. He is attended to by a score of angels that begin to cry out that the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world has overcome. He is greeted by angels that just begin to cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And all of heaven joins in this wondrous celebration. Why? Because Jesus has fulfilled his journey. He has accomplished the task. When he left heaven, it was left silent. They were stunned. He had never not been there. And as they watched, as, as angels reported back, he's a little child now, he's doing okay, he's learning to make furniture, but heaven was just not quite right because Christ was not there. And they watched this with amazement. Old Testament prophets tell us that the angels with awe and wonder watched the plan of God unfold and they, they stood ready. They stood ready. They went and helped him once. If you remember in the garden of Gethsemane, as the weight of redemption was laid upon him and he began to struggle, the Bible says some angels were allowed to come and attend to him and they had been waiting. We're here. We're ready. They were ready, Jesus said, to invade the earth at his invitation. When Pilate was declaring that he would be killed, Jesus said, there's an entire legion standing ready right now that I could summon. They watched in amazement as he was brutalized with the scourge. They watched in horror as he fell under the weight of the cross. They watched in amazement again as he was nailed to the cross. They wondered why the Father did not send them to rescue him from the cross. And then he's laid into the tomb, and, and heaven is quiet. And they wonder, what are we doing? What are we doing? What are we doing? Until the third day. And the father says, hey, you, 
go move that stone. <laughs> and they said, okay, now we're getting things back to normal. Calls another one, you go wait because they're going to come look and you tell them he's alive. And the angels begin to carry out these functions because they're like, okay, now this is making a little more sense. Now we understand what's happened. So he overcomes death and he overcomes hell. They watch and giggle in the corners when he appears in the middle of a locked room. And all the disciples freak out and the angels are in the corners laughing like, aren't they funny? They still don't get it. And Jesus is there showing hands and feet. Thomas, bless his heart. Misses the first one. You know, he, he's there forever, the disciple that helps those of us that are always late. Come on, somebody. You always feel like you missed it somehow. Well, he comes back, bless his heart. Thomas gets to see for himself, and, and then Jesus spends 40 days. He's walking, he's talking, and all the while he's teaching, heaven's preparing to receive him. So when, when Mark says he was received, up into heaven, make no mistake, brothers. There's never been a party, there's never been a parade, and there's never been an outbreak of praise like occurred in heaven when Christ was received back to heaven and sits down at the right hand of God, the place of ultimate honor. If a king tells you to sit at his left, there's some honor. But if a king tells you, have this seat at my right hand, there is no place in any kingdom of higher honor than that seat, for he is the lamb that has overcome. And then Mark, being Mark, skips a bunch of stuff and confuses us. And says in verse 20 that they went out preaching, the Lord working with them. Mark, you just said he's sitting at the right hand of the majesty on high. With your next breath, you declare that the Lord was working with them everywhere. Mark would say, yeah, okay, I assumed you knew about Pentecost. Everybody say Pentecost. Mark would say, do I really have to fill in all the blanks? Stay with me. There was this little outpouring that happened at Pentecost. Ten days after Christ had ascended, the power of heaven was poured out on the church. Jesus had said in John 14, right, in that day, because I live, you will live. And in that day, you will know that you are in me and I am in you. So in the person of his spirit, he goes and he works with them, testifying to the truth of the gospel with the accompanying signs. This is the Christian distinctive, that we have a living Lord. If you follow anything else, all you're left with is your own devotion, your own strength, your own conviction. To try to follow the example of, of your great leader. It's all you've got. If you're Buddhist, all you get to do is look at the example of Buddha and then try your best. If you're Muslim, all you get to do is read the teachings of the Quran and then try your best. If you follow any other faith, it's just you and however well you can work it out. I read it and I try. I read it and I try. I read it and I try. So when they try to say, and Christianity's like that, an empty tomb cries out, no, a thousand times no. For in the Christian gospel, a different thing happens. Jesus does not say, try hard to do for me. Jesus says, why don't I come do in you? And I will be in you. And you will be in me. And it won't be about what you can do for me. It'll be about what I can do through you. And you won't be limited to your strength because you'll have mine. You won't be limited to your power because you will have mine. 
You will not be limited to the strength of your commitment to me because you will rejoice in the strength of my commitment to you. This will not be you saving the world for me. This will be us touching the world together. Completely different. Don't let them make you sweat. They declare it's the same because they're ignorant. They say it's all the same because they're stupid. And it's okay. Let them be. As the great prophet Ron White has said, you can't fix stupid. You have to observe it at a distance. Still love it at arm's length. But you can't always fix it. The scripture declares plainly that at the end of the age, many will choose a way of destruction. And there's a narrow road that leads to life, and few will find it. How many are on it with me this morning? Come on, somebody. And there will be a few that find it. And you've got to know that going forward. You're the smartest person in that room, even though they don't know. Because Jesus is alive and living inside of us. And as we go forth, the Lord works with us. How many are glad? How many are glad that when he's working, I mean, (laughs) I'm glad he works on me with me. How how many are are, are kind of happy that when it comes to personal improvement, you're not just on your own, right? The scripture says he works in us both to do and to will according to his own good pleasure. How many are humble enough in this setting to admit the big changes in your life have been him, not you? Come on, you know you turned over a thousand leaves and all you kept finding was yourself. Then you finally fell down on your knees and said, Jesus, and he came and fixed something inside of you. He's our healer. He's our deliverer. All Christian counseling is fine as long as it points to Jesus as the way maker and the one who fixes things because he's the one that's working on you with you. You try and he goes, that's awesome. Let me make up what you lack. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. When you feel weak, don't hang your head. Look up. For that's the point he promised to meet you. And don't feel the pressure to pretend, to try to be what you're not. That you're going to impress God somehow. I had a whole conversation with a lady this week. I was amazed at the burden she was carrying because she was going to impress God. She was going to believe him till he was so impressed. He had to come and do what she wanted him to do. And the devil is a big fat liar and you better not ever pick up that burden. On your best day, you are nothing compared to the wonder of who God is. And on your worst day, he's as willing to touch you as on your best day. That's the miracle of who he is. I don't have to try to fake him out. I just walk with him. And I say, Lord, you know. And he goes, that's the truth. I do know. <laughs> let's, let's work on this together. He works on others with us. Ever had a kid you needed to fix? <laughs> you want to fix them quicker? Invite Jesus into that equation. There's an old way and there's a God way. And every once in a while, the two cross. But still, it is Jesus that works. Those broken family relationships, those things that are messed up and they seem beyond repair. You'd be in a lot of trouble if you were in this on your own, but you're not in this on your own. The Lord working with. You can pray, you can call on the name of Jesus for wisdom. And you're not speaking into the sky, you're talking to the King of Heaven. And he's able to work with. And the church must get back to understanding that he's the one that works on this world with us as well. There's a great push now to just try to be as smart 
as everybody else and to be as intellectually profound as everyone else, to try to figure out how to compete with them um, politically and culturally. And if enough people like us, if we get enough votes, if enough people want to give me the key to the city, at some point we will make an impact here in Casper, Wyoming. And I hate to just burst your bubble, but that's not how the kingdom works. No, the kingdom goes forward one life at a time, and that life is touched by the gospel, not by politics, not by reasoning, and not by people being flashy or starting programs. you got to tell the world that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and when the Holy Spirit penetrates their heart and they bow their knee, then we've reached another life that Jesus can work on, and you tell the next person, and he's not interested in building any kingdom but his own. And he's not worried about how elections turn out because his kingdom's not on the ballot. And the church has got to get back to the power of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit and inviting the Lord, would you come work with us? Because in our own strength, we're not getting it done. If you have people that you've been sharing Christ with and you're frustrated, they're not listening, then invite him, come. And work with me, please. I'm trying. I'm trying, Jesus, to tell my kids. I'm trying to tell my friends. I'm trying to tell my ex. I'm trying to tell my neighbor. I'm trying to tell. And they're just not listening. They're not hearing me. So I'm going to say it louder. Or maybe we invite, Lord, would you come? Would you come? I've told them, but they're not hearing it. But if you would anoint my words. I know we're new Christians now. We get nervous about words like anointing and repentance. And some of the old words make us nervous. We don't say things anymore like holiness because people go. And we have all these little issues in the church. But Jesus wants to work with you. Christian celebrities want you to believe that they're anointed and you aren't. You're just the normal people. Something good's going to happen in your life. you got to travel to a city where an anointed person is preaching. And that crap has paralyzed the church. Because you have as much access to the Holy Spirit as your greatest hero. Read the book. Jesus is as willing to bring revival to your job site through you as with anybody. He's as willing to use you to reach your neighbor as anybody. People sit around waiting, we need to invite so-and-so for a crusade. Everything would change if we had so-and-so come do a worship event. Everything would change if so-and-so came and preached. I got a better idea. Why don't we start with our own worship event? Why don't we get ourselves filled with the spirit of Jesus? And why don't we go make a difference rather than waiting? He's the one that works with the church. See, this is the reason that other faiths meditate and Christians pray. Now, that was better than you realized, so let me help you as I close. Other faiths meditate, Christians pray. Well, Walt, what's the difference? I'm glad you asked. Meditation is a conversation I have with myself about something I want to be true. And that's fine, but never confuse it with prayer. Prayer is a conversation I have with God about things that he knows to be true. I can meditate and maybe make myself better. I can meditate and be in a better mood. If I meditate a little while, I might be nicer to you or nicer to him. But when it comes time to move a devil out of the way, they don't move by meditation. They move by prayer. When it's time for there to be an outpouring of the Holy Ghost, it does not come because we think about it. It comes because we pray and we talk to God. Christians have access to God. That's the difference. Every Buddhist meditates. And when they're done, the little fly is still buzzing around. Christians pray. And the scripture says they have a voice 
in heavenly places. And you begin to say, oh, Lord. And he goes, yes, my child, what? It's totally different because he's alive. Now, if you learn how to meditate, good. I have to meditate on Jesus to try to be a little bit more like him. Amen. Some of you are already delivered. You're already holy. You do good. You never get grumpy. You never get cranky. So you have no idea what I'm talking about. But those of us that still have a little flesh on tap, those of us that have an instinct for some five-fold ministry, some of us have to really stop for a second and meditate. What would Jesus do? And I don't think Jesus would throw this at him. So I won't. Meditation has its place, but never confuse it for the power of prayer. A conversation with God. And you invite him to that stuff that you can't do anything about. A lot of times in our culture right now, the emphasis really has been on understanding how good you are and how strong you are and all that you can get done. And that's fine because I know some people are killing out their own opportunities just through apathy and laziness, so I understand where all of that comes from. But then you run into stuff that you can't do. You come face to face with circumstances that no matter how hard you try, you won't get it done. And then all of a sudden, when you're at the end of yourself, you look up, and we'd be in a bad shape if he was dead. Paul actually said, and stunned the whole world, nobody ever preaches about it. Paul actually said once, if Jesus is dead, we're the most pitiful people on the earth. We'd be in a bad shape if he was dead. Aren't you glad he's not? That when I get to the end of myself and I go, Jesus, I'm not talking to his memory. And I'm not laying flowers at his tombstone. I'm talking to him because he's a living hope. The king of heaven goes, yes, son. Remember when you said ask? I do, son. Well, I'm asking. And it goes beyond I'm thinking. I'm pondering, I'm focusing. No, I'm asking. I'm going beyond what I can dream up on my own because I found a problem bigger than me. And right at that moment, the living Jesus begins to show himself awesome by working with us. I mean, it's not hard to figure out. Quick little poll. How many of you have something happening that you need God to do it because you can't do it? Just quick little poll. All right, look around. Look, let's hold your hands up. Don't be lazy. I'm the only one working hard. Hold your hand up for a minute and, and look around the room for a second. See all these hands that are up? See how much you would be in a real bad shape if he was dead. But you're not in bad shape at all because he's not dead. He's alive. And when we begin to talk to him, oh, see, this, this will feel different. Don't worry. I'll never embarrass anybody. But you raised your hand, didn't you? Just now? So in a, in, you don't have to give details. If you, what do you need God to do? Okay. Anything specific? Like what did you pray about yesterday? And none of you feel bad for her. I'm not picking on her. I'm just asking. You got a room full of grandmas and grandpas that start to go, hey, wait a minute now. Don't pick on her. I'm not. I'm not. I'm just curious. What, what are you asking him to do? Guidance. So let's, let's do this. You be silent for a minute, and we're going to pray for you. And the Holy Spirit's going to show you stuff because Jesus is alive. And you all stretch your hand this way. Father, in the name of Jesus, you're a living hope right now. And your daughter needs wisdom. And you promised, if anyone lacks wisdom, let them ask, and it will be given to them. So Holy Spirit, give her wisdom right now. That decision she's labored over, she would know right now. 
that question about that relationship or that job opportunity, the different things she's trying to figure out, give her perfect light and perfect wisdom right this moment because you are alive and not in any trouble at all. You're willing and ready to work with us, to work with us. Now, out of curiosity, when we began to pray, if you began to sense his presence just a little bit, raise your hands and worship him for just a moment and thank him that he's alive. See, we talk about this stuff, but this is really simple. He's alive. He says, ask me for stuff. I'm alive. Seek some stuff. I'm alive. Knock on some doors. I'm not dead. I'm alive. And we worship you, Jesus, as the one who's overcome death and hell. And no matter what our request, we don't bring it to a tomb. We bring it to a living Christ. You're so amazing. We worship you, we praise you, and we exalt you in this room. Let's take a moment real quickly, and whatever it was you raised your hand about, Right here in this moment, ask him to work that in your life, see, because that's how, how complicated it is. Father, you know every need in this room. You know everything that's going on in every heart. You know what's happening in every life. You know what's happening, what battles are being fought in every single heart that's in this place, every single heart watching from afar or listening online. You know you're an ever-present help in a time of trouble. You work with us because you're alive. So we ask you for healings today. We ask you for wisdom today. We ask you for deliverance today. Father, we pray you'd move depression off of one of our lives today. We pray, God, in the name of Jesus, that you would move aside that disease that they can't figure out. We pray against cancer, and we pray against diabetes. We ask you to be the Lord that heals the church, that you would come in mighty power and touch. We ask you to be the restorer, the one that rebuilds that relationship that seems too broken. We pray that you would heal the brokenhearted. We ask you to release forgiveness where somebody's bound up in their bitterness, God. We ask you in Jesus' name to shed your love abroad in the hearts of any person that feels like you're far away or feels like they failed too many times or feels like you're disappointed with them. Jesus, touch every single person looking to you because you're alive. You're alive and working with the church. And we worship you and we exalt you and we praise you. You're so, you're so good. 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 I, um, yeah, God is good. I, um, so I don't know why, but, but Lacosta, I want us to pray for your foot. I know doctors have done their deal, and I'm sure that's fine. And we are, How many are glad for doctors? I'm, I'm glad they know things. I just have a sense, though, there's something about it God wants to mend in addition to what they've done, if you don't mind. So, Father, in Jesus' name, just touch and heal. You know what men have done, and you know the limitations of what men can do. And you know how faithful... <laughs> How faithful Lacosta is. She gets more done walking around on one foot than I usually do on both mine. It's pretty cool. So refresh her too. That, that's awesome. Just rain Holy Spirit refreshments down on her life. But heal and restore and mend in that foot. In all the ways that men maybe can't. Things that they are not able to fix. We ask you to fix it all till it's better than new, and we praise you. We praise you. We praise you. All I'm trying to say this morning is don't get so busy being Christian that you forget to invite Christ to be with you. Because if you're not careful, it just turns into a to-do list. If, if I don't do this stuff and I do do this stuff, I'm being a Christian. Amen. Well, that's great, but don't do it without him. That would, be completely that would be completely defeating the purpose. 
He wants to do life with you. He wants to go with you and work with you. That's why he conquered the grave and rose. If his memory would have been enough, he wouldn't have bothered. But he was going to be the living Lord of the church. And so always remember to just take him with you. Amen? In the Lord, I hope.